good to be with you today again. We're going to finish up Genesis next Sunday, so we'll, uh, we're kind of diving into some of the later chapters in Genesis today and next week, and then we'll do Holy Week. Let me start by asking you this. Can I tell you about my dream? Great. When I said that question, one of two things went through your head. One, raise your hand if you thought uh, that I was going to tell you about the thoughts and images that I had while sleeping. Raise your hand if some of you thought I was going to tell you that. Okay? The second thing is, raise your hand if you thought I was going to tell you about some of the aspirations and ambitions I have for the future. It's one or the other, right? A dream is either something you've experienced most often at night, hopefully not of the daydream variety during this message, uh, or it's something you're hoping for, something you desire to experience. And today we're going to talk a little bit about dreams. It's kind of weird. There's some common dreams, falling, being chased, naked in public, uh, flying, losing teeth, failing a test. Maybe one of you have had this common dream before. This was a funny dream meme. Whoa, that was a crazy dream. My brain, seven seconds later, what dream? That usually happens to me. I don't remember a lot of my dreams. Okay, and then I was looking at an article, Nine Common Dreams and What They Supposedly Mean by this Kendra Cherry. She said this, in all likelihood, the things you experience in your dreams are probably a reflection of the concerns hmm, that you face in your daily existence. I, I don't think that's rocket science. The, the things you dream about that are in your subconscious are probably the things that you think about or are fearing or are struggling with in this life. Yeah, not rocket science. But today I want us to consider not just the dreams that we have at night, but maybe some other types of ambition dreams that we have. I want to tell you about a group called Voices of Hope. This is a children's choir out of California. And I don't know if you've ever heard of them before, but they have a dream. And their mission or their dream in life is to change the world one song at a time. For any of you that are America's Got Talent fans, they were on in 2018. And it's a, a powerful thing to see children singing a song that maybe you recognize from the movie The Greatest Showman about dreams. But I want you to consider how moved Simon Cowell was. Let's take a look. It's everyone's dream on a show like America's Got Talent to have Simon Cowell give them a standing ovation. And it's a powerful thing for us to see young people singing about a million dreams is all it's going to take for the world we're going to make. Today we're not going to look at a million dreams, we're going to look at three. And from the unlikely spot of prison of all places, we're going to look at Joseph his life a little bit, Jacob's son, and how his life was intertwined with dreams, his own, and a few others. Join me in Genesis 39 and 40. Let me give you just a quick backstory here. Joseph, remember, is Jacob's son, and he's the favored one. He's the one loved the most, the son of Jacob and Rachel. And uh, Jacob gives Joseph this wonderful ornamental robe coat thing. And his brothers are jealous, so jealous that they try to leave him for dead but decide to sell him. Let's make a little money off this, and that's where we pick this up. Genesis 39, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. All right, so Potiphar is kind of a key official of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar is one of the right-hand men, and he's the captain of the guard. He's somebody that deals with maybe some military things, maybe some prison things. He's a high-ranking official, and now Joseph is under his care. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. 
He lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, pause, time out, pause. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, how did he do that? How do you see that the Lord is with or in somebody? My guess is it was in the way Joseph spoke, in the way he acted, in the way he cared for other people, maybe in how Joseph worshiped and prayed to the God of heaven. His master, Potiphar, saw it, and he saw that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Wow, no longer just a slave. Now you're kind of like the personal assistant servant kind of person of Potiphar. Potiphar put him in charge of his household. Whoa, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. His house, his possessions, his children, the other slaves and servants. Talk about a trusting relationship that Joseph has earned with this guy, this high-ranking official in Egypt. Now, the Word of God says in Genesis 37 that Joseph was 17. It also says that Potiphar's wife took notice of this strapping young man. It says he was well-built and handsome. I mean, there are some 17-year-old boys, a couple of them here today, that are well-built and handsome. And his wife proposed to Joseph, hey, I have an idea. Let's play pretend. You pretend to be my husband for a night. And Joseph goes, "Uh uh-uh, no. You're a married woman, and I have a trusting relationship with your husband, and I'm supposed to take care of everyone. I'm not doing that. And it says, day after day, she pestered him. I was 17 once. That would have been difficult, I think, to keep saying no, no, no. But there came this moment where she trapped him and she's got him in that spot and tonight's the night, you're being my husband. And he runs out of the house without his cloak on because she was grabbing onto it. He literally runs from the temptation naked. And Potiphar's wife decides to tell a different story to her husband. A false story accuses him of being the one trying to take advantage of her. And now Potiphar is in this weird spot. Do I believe this man that I have entrusted, this young man, or do I believe my wife? And there had to have been a weird relationship there. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Indeed, he was. He, God, showed him, Joseph, kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. That's either a lazy warden or Joseph is a pretty phenomenal young man. I'm guessing at this point Joseph is 19, maybe 20. And for any of you young people out there that think, I'm nothing. I've got nothing to give to this world. The story of Joseph is a pretty cool example of when life does a lot of ups and downs, God can work in and through you to be a powerful leader for him. So Joseph is now in prison, and the, he's doing all the rounds. He's taking care of all the prisoners. He's checking in on them. He's making sure everybody is healthy and as happy as they can be, and the warden pays no attention to him. All right, now it's time to get to our three dreams. Ready? Sometime later, let's pretend he's celebrated his 21st birthday in prison. Just stay with me. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pause cupbearer, okay? We don't have a lot of those in today's world, but if you know Bible stuff, if you know the story of Nehemiah at all, the cupbearer is probably the most trusted official to the king, to Pharaoh, because every meal, the cupbearer brings Pharaoh or the master his wine. 
He pours it and he brings it. But before he brings it to the master, he tastes it. Why? Just in case someone was trying to poison the master or the pharaoh or the king, the cupbearer would then die and the king would go, oh, shouldn't have any of that wine. This is a pretty significant trusting relationship. And the cupbearer to the king and the baker to the king. I, I'll admit when I was younger, I always thought that that word would mean like the chef or the head cook. In Hebrew, it actually means baker. So Pharaoh has a sweet tooth and he's the guy, this guy makes all the pies and the cakes and the pastries. <laughs> okay. Uh, they have offended their master. My guess is it was more than the wine is sour and the muffins are burned. I'm thinking because otherwise they would just lose their jobs. No, but to be thrown into prison, there's conspiracy afoot. Something has happened where the Pharaoh has heard that there's something going on. Someone's trying to assassinate me and these two guys need to go to prison. He's angry with them. He put them in custody of the house. of Potiphar in the same prison where Joseph was confined Potiphar the captain of the guard here he is hello Potiphar assigned them to Joseph and he attended them he served them he took care of them because that's what Joseph did he had earned the right as a 21 year old in the eyes of the warden whose boss was Potiphar to take care of that which happened in the prison, including the people. So now you've got this moment set up where Joseph is checking in on this cupbearer and this baker every day and checking in on them and making sure they're fed and, and Potiphar somehow is still having a trusting relationship with Joseph. After they had been in custody for some time, three months, two months, uh, my guess is Pharaoh needs enough time to do an investigation. We've got to figure out who's behind this. Each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison had a dream the same night. Not shocking. I bet if I were to poll you right now and say, how many of you had a dream last night that you remember, some hands would go up. Uh, our sleep cycle was maybe a little bit off last night, and maybe your REM cycle happened a little different when the alarm clock went off or whatever. It's not uncommon that people remember dreams. But these two guys wake up and go, whoa, I had the craziest dream last night. Me too. Me too. And they talk about that a little bit. And each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them, because that's what he would do the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. He knew them well enough to know their moods to know how they would normally act. He had enough of a relationship with the prisoners to be able to speak into their lives of how they are doing. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? And man, can we learn a lesson from the 21-year-old Joseph? What if we ask that question to people that are hurting? What if instead of passing by someone, we say, hey, something seems off today. Are you all right? Is everything okay? How are you doing? And really sit and listen. Joseph did that. He sat down with them and said, hey, what's up? What? You seem really sad today. We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one here to interpret them. Then Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? And that is a key spot for us today. When life gets chaotic or confusing, God is the one that can bring clarity. And Joseph knew it. Tell me your dreams, he said. Maybe God will reveal that to us. All right, so here's the cupbearer. And he says, so there were these three vines, one, two, three, and there were these clusters of grapes on the vines, and, and I was holding Pharaoh's cup, and I was squeezing the grapes into the cup, and, and then I gave the cup to Pharaoh. 
What does that mean? And Joseph says, the three vines are three days. And in three days, you're going to be restored to your position. You're going to be the cupbearer to the king again. You're going to hand him his wine. Great. Sounds like a good dream. And then Joseph tells him his dream, his ambition, his hope, his his kind of plan. He says, but when all goes well with you, when you get your job back, when everything feels normal again, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Here we're going to see the, the heartstrings pulled a little more. Joseph gets real. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. I was sold into slavery. And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. I'm innocent, he says. So if you don't mind, cupbearer, who I've taken care of for months, could you just mention me to Pharaoh? Can you just help a brother out here, please? So the baker is watching, and he sees what's happening, and he goes, Hey, um, can can I tell you my dream? And the baker says, So there's these three baskets, and they were on my head, and on the top of the basket were all the yummy cookies and the muffins and the pastries, And the birds were eating those. And Joseph goes, "Uh uh-huh. The three baskets are three days, and Pharaoh is going to hang you, and the birds are going to eat your flesh. Oh, is there any other interpretations to my dream? Is there an option B? Three days later, on Pharaoh's birthday, he brings these two guys out and he restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. Because Pharaoh had done enough investigation to realize it was that sneaky baker trying to poison him or hurt him or something. So he paid for his sin through death. I would love to tell you that this story had a, and they all lived happily ever after except the baker, but it was not the case. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> How sad. Seriously. Think about being the 21-year-old in prison, going, maybe today's the day that he remembers to say something to Pharaoh. Which of these three guys do you kind of connect with? You've got the baker whose sin was exposed and it's hanging there for all to see. You've got the self-focused cup bearer. Oh, man. And I, man... I'd love to blame people in the Bible when things happen and kind of it lifts off the page to me, but can you really blame him? He gets restored to his job. The first thing I'm doing if I'm that cupbearer is not saying, hey, um, there's another prisoner. Would you mind letting him out too? If I'm the cupbearer, I am putting my head down and doing the best job I can to restore trust with my master, right? But sometimes we get pretty self-focused and we only see things through the Jason Schleicher lens. Or maybe we're a little bit like Joseph today. And we feel forgotten and frustrated. Which, which of the three are you? Maybe all of them. Your sin is exposed for others to see. A decision you made and people can see it. You've been found out. Maybe you're just a little bit too focused on me, myself, and I. Maybe you feel forgotten. What did I tell you at the beginning? The Lord was... You were daydreaming. The Lord was... With. Everyone say with. 
Okay, the Lord was with Joseph, is what it said. When he got sold, when he was in prison, the Lord was with Joseph. God didn't forget him, and he doesn't forget you either. Isaiah 49 says this, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. How precious is that? I love when God's word uses hands to describe something about our God. Isaiah says at other points, the righteous right hand of God holding you, lifting you up. God's hands has your name, your picture on it. And his hands were stretched on a cross. God didn't even forget you to the point of death because he loved you so much. So Salem, can I, can I tell you about my dream? My dream is that all people everywhere, every nation, every language, every skin color, every economic class, every age, that all people would hear and believe the good news of God's grace in Jesus Christ. My dream is that everyone would know that there is a God, a loving, compassionate, mercy-filled, gracious God who could never and who will never forget them. My dream is that we, Salem, that we become the conduit of God's love with our lips and his peace in our lives to our family, to our friends, to our coworkers, to our classmates, to our teammates, to our neighbors. This is my dream. I'll end with this, Psalm chapter three. I, I lie down and sleep, which some of you would like to do right now. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. That was true for Joseph, and that is true in your life as well. When life has ups and downs, when you feel like you've been found out, when you feel like you're in prison, when you feel forgotten, the Lord sustains you too, no matter what. So sweet dreams, Salem. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you and praise you for your presence that was with Joseph and that goes with us wherever we go. Lord, we thank you for taking our sin to a cross, for engraving us on the palms of your hands. Lord, remind us today that we are never forgotten, that you are always loving, gracious, and faithful. Lord, bless us with the dreams, the ambitions, the hopes that we have in this life, not to be so self-focused, but to see how we can serve, just as that young man Joseph did. Give us your grace. Give us opportunities to serve the people around us for your glory. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.